All right. Well, welcome to Lunch with the Birds. My name is Amanda Duran. I am the Program Coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with our webinar series, um, the Outreach Committee of the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative brings you these webinars um, on the third Wednesday of every month um, on a variety of different bird and conservation-related um, topics. And if you're not familiar with OBCI, we are a um, partnership of about 100 different organizations across Ohio that support bird conservation. So, as I said, um, our meeting is being recorded, and all of our past meetings are archived on the two websites um, that are on the screen here. Um, the first is on our website and has a list of all of our past webinars, and then the second there is our YouTube channel. So just to give um, people some idea of some topics that we've covered in the past, you can see um, all of those different, um, there's about 13 videos on there right now, I believe. Um, so these are some of our past topics. But if you have any ideas for um, new webinars or new topics that you would like to see, please um, feel free to um, email me, and I will post my email in the chat box. Um, for anyone who's interested. I especially wanted to point out that the recording is available from our uh, webinar last month. We did have to postpone due to the illness of our speaker. So if anyone wasn't able to make the rescheduled time, um, the recording of Winter Bird Survival by Tammy Saunders from Metro Parks of the Toledo area is now available on our um, YouTube channel. Um, before we get started, just a few things um, to remind you. Everyone is muted, um, so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to send those to us using that chat box and any comments as well. Um, our presenter has um, welcomed any questions throughout the presentation, so if anything comes up, um, feel free to enter those. If you're having any issues um, with your connection, I encourage you to close any other internet browser windows or file sharing programs that you might have open. And that um, usually helps to resolve any issues that you might be having. So with that, I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Christopher Tanra. Um, he is the new Assistant Professor of Avian Wildlife Ecology with OSU. Um, Dr. Tanra has a BA from the State University of New York in Anthropology an MS from Humboldt State University in Wildlife Biology, and got his PhD from the University of Maine in Biology. Um, before coming to OSU, George, uh, <laughs> Dr. Tanra was the George Didden Conservation Biology Fellow at the Smithsonian National Zoo and a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Um, his primary research interests lie in examining the underlying mechanisms for how individuals interact uh, with their environments. And as I said, um, Dr. Chandra just recently started as an assistant professor of avian wildlife ecology at the School of Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up your presentation, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Chandra. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you, everybody, for uh, having me today and for joining us. Um, I just thought I'd give today kind of a, a little rundown of, of some work I've done on migratory birds that kind of highlights some themes of my overall uh, research and themes I hope to continue working on that I'm here in Ohio and specifically on, on birds here in Ohio. Um, so... Um, the title of my presentation is Avian Ecology in the Context of the Full Annual Cycle, and um, when I talk about the full annual cycle here, um, I'm talking about the the progression of life history stages that birds travel through as they complete their life cycle every year. Um, so this painting here kind of depicts uh, sort of what I'm talking about as birds progress from a nesting phase, as you see on the upper um, left-hand corner of the painting there, and then into a, a, a fall migratory phase down to their wintering grounds, um, spend eight to nine months on their wintering grounds, and then enter a spring migratory life cycle stage um, to get back up to their breeding grounds and start the whole cycle all over again. Um, so, uh, so one of the most important things as ecologists and biologists when we're stuttering, studying birds and thinking about questions we want to ask is that we do so in the context of the life cycle stage we're looking at. So, for instance, in this picture of a yellow warbler nest that actually has two cowbird chicks in it, um, if we were asking questions about um, uh, these birds, they're obviously in the breeding stage. There are birds in a nest here. So if we wanted to know why birds selected this habitat, we would ask questions about 
what kind of food was available for feeding their chicks nearby or why did they choose this branch in terms of is it better concealed from predators than other from nest predators than other places they could have put their nest. And so we take into account what life cycle stage they're in and what their needs are in that life cycle stage. But if we look at, say, this barred owl in a tree cavity, we might be tempted to say, well, this bird is also obviously in the nesting stage because it's inside a tree cavity. However, if I told you I took this picture in December, that might change what you think about this cavity in terms of this would actually be a winter roosting cavity. So the things you measure about how this bird selected this cavity over others might be different. If it was a nesting cavity, it might have to do with proximity to food or concealment from predators, whereas if it's a roosting cavity, it might be you want to measure things relative to how this bird stays warm throughout the winter, how it, how, what are the, the temperature characteristics of this cavity. So there's a temporal component to determining what stage of the life cycle we're really looking at. We can use that information of what we know about the bird's ecology to determine that. Um, in this case, what, the, what time of year the bird is in the cavity. But even with that temporal component, it may not always be clear. So I took this picture of a redneck grebe on its wintering grounds. Uh, so this picture was taken during the non-breeding season in uh, Washington State. But if you look at this bird, it's not in what we would consider its non-breeding plumage. So on the lower right is a picture of what a non-breeding redneck grebe looks like. But this redneck grebe in the center of the picture is actually in its breeding plumage. So even though it's on its wintering grounds, it's obviously devoting some amount of energy towards its breeding season because it's molted into those feathers of its breeding season. It's investing some of its energy into breeding even though it's still on its wintering grounds. And so that's why, to some extent, I feel like maps like this that we see a lot in field guides and, and species accounts can be a little bit misleading. So this map on the left shows the range of the American red start, and the different colors denote different stages in their life cycle. So if, if uh, you look at the reddish colors at the top, that denotes the breeding grounds. The yellowish colors are where you find them during migration, and the blue is where you find them in the winter. So there's um, uh, this, these maps sort of implicate that a bird you find, say, in Jamaica, as the low, lower arrow is pointing to, is in its breeding life, in non, I'm sorry, wintering life cycle stage. If you encounter a bird, a red start in Florida, then you're seeing it in its migratory life cycle stage. If you encounter it here in Ohio, you're looking at its breeding life cycle stage. But actually, the stage that, diff that birds are in, what stage of their life cycle, is actually not determined by where they are in a map. It's actually determined by complex physiological and behavioral changes that these birds undergo throughout the year. So you can't necessarily only study breeding by only looking at what's going on here in Ohio or in New York or other parts of the breeding range. So... My work and the work of uh, a lot of the people who have mentored me have focused on these questions of do we look at enough of the life cycle stage so that we can understand what limits populations of migratory birds. And we've been concerned when we look at the literature and we've done surveys of the ecological literature and specific to birds even. And all, more than 70% of studies of, of birds takes place do only during the breeding season and only focuses on that one stage, the breeding season, when they're on what you would consider the breeding grounds, as you would define it in the Red Starts case in this map. Um, and there's very little focus, only 30%, that focuses on migration or molt or wintering. And that's actually what the stages that birds are in for most of the year. So they're only in their breeding season about three months of the year, but for nine months of the year, they're in these different phases of what we would call their, more generally, their non-breeding season, uh, which encompasses migration and wintering and molt. Um, so the question is, is, is this a problem when we want to start thinking about managing and conserving bird populations? And one of the reasons we think this is a problem is because of uh, what we've revealed in a, in a lot of bird systems is, is what we call seasonal interactions. And that is that things that happen in different phases of the life cycle don't happen in a bubble. 
So what happens to an individual on the wintering grounds can stay with that individual and ultimately affect how it performs once it gets to its breeding grounds. So seasonal interactions you can define as when an individual or popul when the outcomes that occur for an individual or a population in one life cycle stage are actually influenced by events or conditions it experienced in a preceding stage. So this isn't unique to birds. This has actually been documented in, in species like moose, where the um, uh, phenology of vegetation in the spring actually ultimately influences the body condition of moose in the fall six months later. Or these uh, slimy salamanders, where the rainfall in one year actually can impact the, the number of eggs they produce in a clutch in following years. And so by focusing on only one season, you can miss a lot of the story about what's determining what happens in that season. If you want to know why birds are fledging more in one year than in another year, it might be that it has nothing to do with what's happening there on the breeding grounds. It could have a lot to do with what happened to them on the non-breeding grounds before they ever got there. And so th this has brought us um, to do a lot of work in Jamaica. And this work was first initiated by um, three people. Um, oops. Oh, sorry. Um, I thought I changed this slide. But uh, Dick Holmes uh, at the uh, Dartmouth University, uh, Tom Sherry at Tulane University, and, and my mentor, Pete Mara, back in the 80s, started becoming concerned with these questions of, are we focusing too much on the breeding season? And should we be looking at this nine months out of the year when birds are nowhere near their breeding grounds, but they still have to survive um, through some of the most extreme um, environmental conditions um, that they'll experience during the year? The reason breed, birds breed when they do is because that's when there's a lot of food and that's when there's enough food that they don't they have more than they need for themselves and they can provide some of it to their young. So um, they began uh, doing research in Jamaica to look at how are birds performing down on the wintering grounds and how might events that are happening down there play a role in the dynamics of populations, whether populations are declining or growing, survival rates, things like that. Um, so those three people were really important in, in initiating this focus on stages of the life cycle outside of the breeding grounds, um, specific to, to migratory birds and neotropical migratory birds. And so Jamaica is a really great place to work. I'm really lucky to have hooked up with these people because uh, there's uh, a lot of great things about working down there. It's, it's obviously beautiful. It's an island in the Caribbean just south of, of Cuba. Um, and has lots of endemic animals and plants like this uh, penguin, which is a wild relative of pineapple. That's an endemic ground-growing bromeliad there on the upper left. Uh, the Jamaican uh, croaking gecko, which is an endemic lizard, uh, to Jamaica on, uh, coming out of a nest cavity there in the upper middle. Uh, down in the lower middle, uh, one of the really gorgeous butterflies that occurs down there, uh, the Antilli Antillian malachite. And great things to experience also in terms of food, like Scott Bonnet peppers on the lower right, and great music, uh, like on the uh, uh, showing that picture on the upper right. So just a aside to say, if you haven't been to Jamaica, it's a really great place to visit. And I encourage you not to go to Sandals or one of the Walden resorts there, but really get out and experience the natural world and, and the culture there, because it's a, it's a really exciting place to visit that many people who go there never actually um, experience. And it's an interesting place to work. You deal with a lot of obstacles. So one one benefit is this is uh, on the left showing the beach that we walk to uh, to our field sites. So you can't beat that commute into your work um, every day as we work at, at these sites with wintering migratory birds. But we share that beach with uh, a large population of American crocodiles. So the picture on the upper right is showing uh, tracks that we would often walk across on the beach of a crocodile. You can see the, the big foot and the, of the hind limb and the small foot of the forelimb, and then that's the tail dragging through the middle. And sometimes we actually got to go out and, and catch some of these crocodiles. That's, that's a very small one. They get quite a bit bigger than that and quite a bit more dangerous. Um, but it was an exciting opportunity to go out with some biologists from the University of West Indies 
Um, but it is a challenge of working in some of the areas we work because we do share it with the crocodiles. And in terms of birds, Jamaica is a really exciting place um, for birds as well. Hummingbirds is one thing. It has some really exciting hummingbirds. Uh, one of the best is the the national bird of Jamaica, which is the, the red-billed streamer tail, uh, which has this really long, long tail extending, or tail feathers extending off its main tail. This is showing one on the, the upper left and then one we actually captured in mist nets on the upper right. So just barely had a long enough ruler to measure that tail. Um, and then on the lower right there, that's the uh, endemic Jamaican mango, which is a very large hummingbird that feeds on bromeliad flowers. And Jamaica is also home to the second smallest bird in the world, the vervain hummingbird, um, which lays the smallest eggs in the world. And that's just a picture of a nest with an egg in it with my thumb for reference to show you just how tiny those eggs are. Uh, Jamaica, of all the Caribbean islands, also has the most endemic species of, of birds. Um, even compared to much larger islands like Hispaniola and Cuba, Jamaican has the most uh, birds that only occur in Jamaica, in, in the, on the island of Jamaica. This is just a few examples of birds we've caught there. Uh, on the upper left, that's the uh, yellow-shouldered grass quit, the Jamaican euphonia to the right of that. Below that is the Jamaican woodpecker, which wasn't too happy to be handled by me and did quite a bit of damage on my finger. Uh, this is a, a Melanerpe species, so related to our uh, red-bellied woodpeckers and uh, red-headed woodpeckers. Uh, that's an orange quit in the in the lower middle, and the Jamaican oriole on the on the left lower hand side. And then a lot of other birds that share the plots with with the birds we study, um, both migratory birds like the Swainson's warbler on the upper left and the black-throated blue warbler on the lower right. Uh, we encounter a lot of those guys on our sites. And then more widely distributed tropical birds, like the on the upper right-hand side, that's the um, the resident subspecies of yellow warblers. So same species as the yellow warblers you would see here, but this is actually a tropical resident that has all this reddish color, not only on in the streaks on its breast, but also on its crown. And these are specialized to mangrove forests all throughout uh, the Caribbean. And then on the lower left-hand side is the worst bird I've ever had to take out of a mist net, the greater Antillean bullfinch. Um, so that bill is as powerful as it looks, and they also scream the entire time that you're holding them. So we try and just <laughs> get them out of the net and let them go. But the star of the show um, for us in Jamaica is the American red start. So the American red start is a neotropical migratory bird. Um, it's widely distributed, as, widely distributed as you saw from the map I showed before. Um, and they, they were the focus of when Dick Holmes and Tom Sherry and Pete uh, started working down there because they're, they're pretty cosmopolitan. They occur in a, in a lot of different habitats in pretty big numbers in Jamaica. And so they were a good species to look at because it's hard in terms of conservation. While we want to conserve all birds, there are, of course, species we are very concerned about because their numbers are very low. But uh, the nice thing about a very common bird like red stars is you can study a lot of birds at once. You can look at a lot of the variation that occurs across a population without having to worry about working with very few rare individuals. We can learn about the ecology of birds in general by studying common species and then applying those things we learn from common species to more rare species. And so red starts were a really good candidate for this in Jamaica because they occur in so many different habitats and they occur in pretty large numbers. And so the map on the right is just showing where our stud main study site was located. Uh, this is the Font Hill Nature Preserve in southwestern Jamaica. Um, if you've ever been to Negril, it's about an hour east of Negril. Negril's on the western tip of the island there. Um, and so they, this, the, the red starts were, um, initially studied there by, by Dick, Tom, and Pete, uh, back in the 80s. And they conti have continued to be studied, um, mostly by Pete, uh, in the last 20 years. Um, and he is now the, the head of the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Uh, so this is a long-term study where we've been able to look at changes over time and, and changes in climate and, and how that's affecting birds over the long term. 
And so what we do down there is we, we catch red starts on these different plots that we have, and we mark them with uh, colored bands on their legs and, and an aluminum band that comes from the USGS um, bird banding lab, and that's a numbered band. But then we put these additional colored bands on their legs. And the reason for doing this is so we can actually go out and see birds in the field and identify specific individuals just by looking at them through binoculars. So uh, if we only had that bird banding lab USGS band on there, we would have to catch the bird every time so we could read the number and see who that individual was. By putting these extra bands on there, we do them in a specific order. And when we see a bird that has colored bands, we read them in a specific order. So actually, every bird sort of has a name, uh, so, to say, so to speak, um, based on the order that color bands are on their legs. So this bird in the picture is orange over a over black aluminum. Um, and we go out onto our plots, which have uh, flag flagged uh, grid points that are uh, 50 meters apart from each other. And then we can use a map like you see on the right here of the gridded area and see a bird in the field, know where we are based on the, those grid points on the map, and every day we see it, we can mark where we saw it, and we can follow it and see what area it uses on our study plots. So by doing that, over the course of the entire winter, we can look and see, okay, this is, was this bird's territory this year, and look at how territories change over years, how the number of territories on a plot changes every year, which we see quite a bit of change in. Um, and then we can follow that bird until it departs on spring migration because we know where its territory is. We also know when it's no longer there, when it leaves on migration later in the spring. And so um, the arrow showing you the territory of this bird, orange over black, that's use O for orange, BK for black, comma, aluminum. So it's saying that this bird you see in the picture for that year in 2008, that was his territory on our plots. Um, so it's a good way for us to follow birds all throughout the season, watch their behavior, and, and, and see how those things change over time. And so when we're studying birds in Jamaica, we, we've concentrated on two habitats. Um, one we sort of consider low quality, one high quality, and I'll talk about why that is. Um, but basically, we wanted to look at how birds in, and, and how birds have been or are affected by different types of habitats they might occupy in in the wintering period. And red starts again were really well uh, disposed to this because red starts are territorial, as you saw from that map. They have a territory they defend all um, winter long. They're different from breeding territories in that. A breeding territory you might see up here would have a male and a female and um, maybe their offspring later in the, in the season. In, in the case of the winter, you actually have males and females defending separate territories, so every individual has its own territory. And so we look at what habitats those territories are in and how it impacts the birds that are occupying them. And so one thing about um, the tropics in general is you obviously don't have winters like you do here. But you do have very harsh conditions during the winter months in the form of really, really dry um, periods. So the seasons in the tropics are more wet season versus dry season as opposed to winter, spring, summer, fall. And so during the wet season, habitats are all pretty good. There's lots of water out there, so there's lots of leaves and lots of bugs. So birds kind of do pretty well everywhere. And so one of the habitats we work in is what we call scrub habitat. Um, this is sort of a dry forest, um, pretty diverse with a very thick understory of viney tangles and things like that. And so in the wet season, it looks pretty good. It's, it's pretty green here. There's lots of leaves out. There's going to be lots of bugs feeding on those leaves, so lots of food uh, for red starts. However, in the dry season, this same location looks like this. So a lot of the trees in the tropics actually drop all of their leaves in the dry season. It's almost like we see our deciduous trees do here in the winter because of the cold, but they're doing it there because there's so little water, they don't want to try and invest in, in keeping their leaves on, so they basically go into a dormant period where they drop all their leaves. And so this dry period starts in late January and extends all the way through into late March. 
so right right in the period where birds are going to have to begin um, preparing to migrate. When all these leaves go away, um, it can have implications for the food of, of these red starts, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second. And so the other habitat we work in is mangrove forest. So these are coastal forests that are often inundated um, both by uh, groundwater or stream water and then usually some amount of salt water coming in from the ocean uh, due to tides. Um, so these are, are really wet, wet forests. The trees often have their feet wet. Um, it will dry out a little bit sometimes during the dry season where you won't have these open pools like you see in this picture. Um, but the, the ground almost always stays moist and muddy, and so there's always water available for the trees. So unlike the scrub habitat, during that dry season, we don't see any dropping of the leaves by the mangrove trees. They hold on to their leaves all season long. And so for many reasons, we consider this a good quality habitat for red starts. And so this is just showing a study that uh, my colleague Colin Studs and, and Pete Mara did uh, in 2007, looking at what the impact of this dry season is on, um, on red starts. And so the graph on the, on the left-hand side is showing arthropod biomass, so how many bugs are out there. And then um, the graph on the right-hand side is showing the body condition in terms of how much red starts weighed in each of these habitats. And so the open circles are showing mangrove habitat. The filled-in circles are showing scrub habitat. So pretty much through that dry period, January through March, that dry season I was just talking about, there's always more food in the mangrove than there is in the scrub. Because the scrub drops all of those leaves, there's no leaves for the bugs to feed on, so there's no bugs for the red starts to feed on. So they're in a really tight crunch in terms of finding enough food. The only exception is that point all the way on the right, which was a year of very high rainfall. So on the x-axis, on the lower axis, that's showing rainfall during that normally dry period. So in years when the dry period actually isn't so dry and you get a lot of rain, then you do tend to get more insects in the scrub, and, and that habitat can actually be pretty okay. And so the graph on the right is showing how that difference affects red starts. <laughs> their body mass, and you can see the black circles, the birds that are in that scrub habitat weigh a lot less than birds in that, that mangrove habitat. And if you look at the numbers here, basically the zero in the middle of the, the y-axis is zero basically means a bird that's in good condition. If you're in positive numbers, or, or is in average condition. If you're in positive numbers, you're in very good condition. If you're above zero, if you're in negative numbers, you're in very poor condition. And so these birds in scrub, when they go through this dry season, are not in very good shape, and they're, they're having to uh, get through this really tough period in order to eventually, hopefully, recover once the rains come back again. And so this has impacts on migration. And Pete, um, in a very famous paper that he published in Science, found that if you look at when these birds depart on migration, it's different between these good habitats and these bad habitats. And this is important because in spring, birds want to arrive on the breeding grounds as quickly as they can because they have a very limited breeding season. So they need to get their breeding done so then they can then migrate back down um, again in the winter um, uh, for the next winter. And so... This is a really important thing that birds in the mangrove forest, which here is in black, uh, the black squares, when you look at when they leave their territories on spring migration, they're leaving a lot earlier than the birds in the scrub forest, which are in those open squares. And so <clears throat> this is a, the, was really the first indication where these events that are happening down in, in Jamaica, thousands of miles away from where these birds are breeding, could be having impacts on ultimately how, how well they breed. And rainfall plays a big role in this also. So um, uh, Colin, uh, Colin Studs again and Pete Mara, so they, they looked at the study of how rainfall impacts that day birds depart on spring migration. And so it's not only the habitat they're in, but it's also how much rainfall overall there is. So rainfall is 
driving a lot of insect abundance in Jamaica, and that amount of that insect abundance is ultimately affecting how birds perform in terms of migration. So this graph is actually showing departure dates, and these were individuals where he looked at the same individuals over six different years and how many and when they departed on migration. And so in very dry years, so on the left side of the graph, they were departing pretty late. So they were departing 36 days after April 1st. Whereas in days and years when there, were a lot, there was a lot of rainfall on the right-hand side of the graph, those same birds were departing about 30 days um, after April 1st. So about a six-day difference in when they departed on migration based on how much rainfall that there was, which is pr uh, pretty much an index for how many bugs there were. The more rainfall there is, the more bugs there are, and, and the better it is for the red starts. So this was an important indicator that not only habitat type, but also climate is going to be really important for birds. And this is, of course, important because we talk a lot about climate change and these habitats. And the Caribbean is supposed to get very dry over the next century as climate change continues to happen. Um, and so this could have a big implication for these birds down on their wintering grounds. So my research focused on this idea I was talking about with the um, with the redneck grebes, where do you actually have birds where they're starting to invest in their breeding season even before they leave their wintering grounds? Um, so this was an important way to look at you know, are, does breeding season, is breeding only really happening on the breeding grounds? Is things that happen on the breeding grounds going to be the only thing that's really going to affect breeding? Well, if birds are starting to actually prepare for breeding before they ever leave their wintering grounds, then that's not the case. And the breeding season then actually extends across all these different places birds are occupying um, before they get to the actual place they nest. And so what I looked at was uh, breeding hormones, uh, specifically androgens in males. Um, so one of the androgens, of course, is testosterone. So testosterone is a really important breeding hormone for males. It controls things like their aggression, their singing, their production of sperm, um, anything they do to try and attract mates and drive off other males. Most of that's regulated by the androgen testosterone. And so if testosterone is increasing, before they leave their wintering grounds, then that's a really strong indication that they're actually starting to prepare for their breeding season while they're still thousands of miles away from their actual nesting site. And so what I did was in midwinter, um, I looked at what their levels of, of androgen were in their blood. We take small blood samples uh, from a vein in their wing. Um, it it's basically amounts to a, a few drops of blood. And we can measure the hormones in that blood. And so what I did was I looked at, on the left-hand side of this graph, what their androgen levels were in midwinter, which were very low, um, and then looked at it again in late winter in two different years, in 2009 and 2010. And in both of those years, for males, which are represented by the circles in the graph, the males increased in their testosterone later in winter. So this was a really strong indication that these males were preparing for breeding before they had even left their wintering territory. Um, what was interesting was, if you look at the change from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the graph, was the increase was actually much smaller in 2010. And 2010 was a really severe drought year at our sites in Jamaica. And so this was telling us that these differences in rainfall are not only affecting things like departure date, but they are also affecting how much birds are investing in breeding prior to departure on migration in one year versus the other. And then the triangles there are just showing females. So I wanted to be sure that this increase in testosterone was specific to males because of the breeding functions of testosterone I, I mentioned before, and that it wasn't just something that happens to all birds. So when I looked at the same thing in females in Jamaica, I didn't see any change. So again, this really strong indication that this increase in, that we see in males is that they're starting to prepare for their breeding season um, while still in Jamaica. And so what was interesting also is that I started to see relationships between the body condition of birds and whether or not they um, were increasing testosterone. And so this got me thinking a lot about testosterone and body condition. And if you're a fan of sports, you know, um, say, in baseball, uh, 
players like Barry Bonds have been accused of, of taking large amounts of testosterone to increase their performance at hitting home runs. Um, or cyclists uh, have been taking testosterone and other androgens uh, to help them cycle faster because it increases the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, which helps you go faster. And so I was wondering, well, these birds that are increasing testosterone, could this also help them migrate faster, arrive faster than their competitors, depart earlier from Jamaica? And so I did an experiment where I, I actually experimentally increased the testosterone levels of some males, and then other males I, I didn't do it. I, I, they were control males. I didn't do any uh, manipulations to. And then I looked at their change in condition and when they ultimately departed Jamaica to see if birds that do increase their testosterone, if they have this advantage in terms of when they migrate, which could ultimately influence when they arrive at their breeding grounds, which could be really important for their breeding success. And so what I found is the birds that I increased testosterone they increased in body mass more. They put on more breast muscle, which is really important for powering a bird's flight. Um, they put on more fat, which they use to fuel their migration while they're flying. Um, and this graph is showing that they ultimately departed earlier on migration. Um, so these white circles are the birds where I manipulated their testosterone. The black circles are the control birds. And so going from left to right, it's just showing the day that they left on migration. And so the birds, um, that had higher testosterone started leaving earlier, and more of them had left earlier than the control birds. So on average, they left about seven days earlier if they had increased testosterone than birds that um, were just controls. So just showing that not only um, are they preparing to breed while they're still on their wintering territory, but also the amount they prepare to breed actually influences their migration. So... Now that we know all these things and we, we, we had learned all these things of what's going on in the wintering grounds, what we really wanted to know was to go to the breeding grounds and see, do these things really affect what happens in breeding? Um, and which is hard to do because there are a lot of red starts out there and we can't follow the same individuals. We don't know all these individuals we're studying in Jamaica. We don't know where they all go to breed. Um, so uh, Pete came up with a pretty ingenious idea for how to how to look at this, and, and we've continued to do this over the years, is using what we call stable carbon isotopes. Um, so just to review what that means, so carbon, the atom that you find in the atmosphere and in and, and almost everything, um, everything we use, uh, carbon is... Uh, in a very common form in the environment, with, which has an atomic weight of 12. It's the, the most common form of that atom of carbon. Um, but for uh, there are much rarer versions of carbon which have extra particles, uh, neutrons, um, that cause them to have different weights. Um, so there's, for instance, a rare form of carbon which has an atomic weight of 13. Um, it's the same atom. It, it pretty much behaves like carbon. It just has a different weight, but there's about, you know, greater than 95% of the carbon out there is carbon-12, but then you have this smaller percentage of carbon-13. And what's useful about this is that the ratio of those two types, it, it varies across the environment in, in predictable ways. Um, and the way that we focused on is that it varies between wet and dry habitats. And this happens because of what plants do in these habitats. So plants breathe through pores in their leaves, we call stomata, and they can open and close those pores. And so plants in a dry habitat, they need to conserve water. If they respirate too much, they're going to respirate water vapor and lose water. So they tend to keep those stomata closed as much as possible. Because of that, they conserve a lot of their carbon, and they have more of that heavier version. Whereas a plant in a wet habitat, like a mangrove tree, their feet are wet all the time. They have plenty of water. They don't worry about conservation of the water as much. So they'll keep those stomata open a lot. And because of that, they lose a lot of that heavier one, heavier version of carbon as they, as they breathe. Um, and so the different habitats, wet and dry, as I'm showing in this picture, from the wet to dry habitat, you get an increasing value of the ratio of those two different kinds of, of carbon um, as you go from wet to dry. And why this is useful for when we study birds is that 
birds are eating insects that are eating these plants. They're eating insects that eat mangrove leaves or eat uh, scrub leaves. And because of that, they actually take that carbon signature into all their tissues. So it's in their blood, it's in their feathers, it's in their toenails. Um, all the all the things that they grow while they're down in that habitat actually takes up that signature. And so we can catch a bird and look at one of those. Um, I'll focus on toenails coming up and actually say, well, this bird came from a drier habitat than this bird if we compare two birds and what their carbon looks like. What we can do with this, then, is if we take a, a tissue that the bird grows, like its toenails, which it grows at a pretty slow rate, um, and we catch the bird as soon as it arrives to its breeding grounds and take a clipping from that toenail, well, that toenail was grown where the bird spent the winter because the, to the tip of the toenail, it takes over a month for the bird to grow, that, grow new uh, toenail out that far. So we know when we take a clipping of that, where that poor part of the toenail was grown where the bird spent the winter on its winter territory. And so if we do that, we can compare that to when they arrived, like I'm showing in this graph, and see how does where, where they spent the winter in a wet habitat or a dry habitat ultimately influence when they arrive on the breeding ground. So remember I showed that study where birds and mangrove departed on spring migration earlier than birds and dry scrub. And we find when we look at the breeding grounds, like in this graph, that arrival day is on the x-axis there, on the lower axis, and then the carbon isotopes, and I just have marked on there, from wet to dry, are on the y-axis. Birds that arrive early tend to be from wet habitats, and birds that arrive late are from dry habitats. So this is exactly what we predict based on what we saw, what we see in Jamaica, where birds from wet habitats depart on migration earlier. And this has shown that in this study that I did and then multiple other studies that uh, people have done in red starts and, and even other species, that birds from those wet habitats ultimately arrive first on the breeding grounds. And so why does early arrival matter? Well, it matters a lot for red starts. Um, and just as a side note, so I talked about the testosterone levels of those birds. When you look at the testosterone levels of those birds that arrive earlier, the birds with high testosterone also arrive earlier um, than birds with low testosterone. So also saying that what I was talking about, these positive effects that testosterone have on migration, it looks like those play out all the way till the birds get there to their breeding ground, that those birds that start preparing to breed earlier ultimately arrive earlier. And so one thing we've consistently found in red starts, both at the site I worked at, um, at the Hubbardbrook uh, Experimental Forest in, in New Hampshire, and studies in, in several other places, has found that birds that arrive early, especially males, are much more successful at breeding. And basically, for every day a male arrives after the first male, his likelihood of successfully fledging a nest is reduced by 12%. And so... We're not exactly sure why that is. Um, I think it has to do with predators. So uh, red starts are often predated by blue jays. And I think the blue jays don't start eating red start nests until they have young to feed. And so I think if you arrive early and you get your nest started and you can fledge your young before the blue jays have hatched their young and are starting to predate nests, I think you're much better off. Um, that's just kind of anecdotal. That's, that's what I thought was going on at my site. But all we know is that consistently, the early arriving birds are the ones that are most successful. Um, so one other thing I just wanted to point out, this is uh, taking you back to Jamaica, um, is another thing we've looked at is, is, is the color of these males. So one thing we found is that in red starts, um, especially a colleague, Matt Rudink, uh, who's at uh, Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia, he did a lot of work on the color of red starts and how it affects how successful males are at, at mating with females and, and having a lot of young. And he found that birds that have much more orange um, in their tail feathers and in their flanks are much more successful. They're much more attractive to females. So one thing I was interested in is a lot of birds we see in Jamaica actually lose a lot of those feathers while they're down there either from avoiding a predator or they're getting in fights with other birds. 
Um, a lot of the residents, like those resident yellow warblers I talked about, they often attack red starts um, because they compete for food. And so I was interested in when birds lose feathers down there, does that have a cost to them? Since these feathers are important when they get to the breeding grounds, um, in terms of how attractive they are when they get there. So what I did was uh, we always collect feathers down there for studies we do with other stable isotopes like the stable carbon stuff. And so we collect a feather and the bird always regrows that feather. So we looked at the change in color from that original feather, which the bird grew during its normal molt cycle at the end of the breeding season, and then the feather it regrew while it was on its wintering territory. Um, so that's just showing on the upper right-hand side the original feather, and the feather below it is the one it regrew. If you look at that, it looks, if, if you have a, a, a good sense of color, you can see that the feather on the bottom is a, quite a bit paler in terms of how orange it is. And the graph below that is showing actual um, data on that, where we use a reflectance um, machine to measure the actual amount of different colors and the saturation. So just all you need to know is I showed those arrows. At the top of the graph is more orange. The bottom of the graph is more yellow. And so what we found with these birds is pretty much all of their feathers became more yellowish when they had to regrow them on the wintering ground. So basically when they're down there, these colors come from insects mostly, these orange and reds that birds have come from insects. And so the insects that they have available to them on their wintering grounds don't have those pigments they need to make that bright orange color. And so losing their feathers down there on the wintering grounds could have another cost to them in terms of what happens when they eventually go to the breeding grounds because they're not going to be as attractive to females when these males get there. So this is just another example of how these events that happen when birds are on the wintering grounds don't happen in isolation and can ultimately affect what happens when birds ultimately come up to breed. So with that, I just want to talk about some research um, going to, um, starting here in Ohio um, and also uh, down in Panama, looking at these sorts of questions in a species of much greater conservation concern than the red start and the prothonotary warbler. Um, these birds are really interesting in several ways, um, and, and they have a lot of issues going on right now that could potentially impact their populations and, and how well they're doing in a conservation sense. Um, so well, we've done a lot of this work on red starts in a, in a species that's very common and, and not really of much conservation concern, I wanted to start applying some of these ideas to a bird that um, here in Ohio is, is actually a species of concern. And so pathonotary warblers, like I said, they're a species of concern here in Ohio and actually throughout much of their range. So Audubon Society, uh, organizations like Partners in Flight, uh, a lot of these uh, conservation organizations focused on birds have, have identified prothonotary warblers as a species of concern um, where they want to see a lot more research happen and action happening to, to protecting their populations. And the reason that they're, they're really of concern is because prothonotary warblers, unlike red starts, on, are habitat specialists. Um, they really focus on two habitats one, focus, one very specific to their breeding needs and one very specific to their wintering needs. And so they're neotropical migrants like red starts. They, they breed here in the temperate zone, then they migrate down to the tropics. So in their breeding grounds, they focus really on forested wetlands. So these are forests that um, are inundated a lot of the year. Um, there's a lot of water around. They eat prey that emerge from these aquatic environments. Um, and so they're really specialized on these. And these habitats have been really altered uh, over the past century, and a lot of areas have been really deforested um, due to, due to um, logging and, um, and other changes, the development and things like that over the last century. So it's been a, a, a habitat type that's really declined. And here in Ohio, it's not very common either, um, just in general at present. And so this loss creates two issues for prothonotary warblers. So one, they're specialized in nesting in cavities. They, they nest in uh, tree cavities, uh, either broken off limbs or old woodpecker cavities. And then a loss of just overall nesting habitat. They're specialized to feed for feeding in these aquatic environments. And so the overall loss of the habitat is also a big concern for them. But then they're not 
doing any better in terms of the status of their habitat in the wintering grounds. And if anything, what's going on in the wintering grounds is more cons more of concern for their population. So they winter in those mangrove forests, like I talked about. I talked about with the red starts. Um, this forest type is very similar to the forest of wetland in that it's a, a lot of trees that are inundated most of the year, trees with their feet wet. So prothonotaries exhibit what we call habitat matching in migratory birds. They basically winter in a habitat that's very similar to the habitat they breed in. And they are very specialized on this. And so the concern with mangrove forest is it's one of the rarest forest types of the world, and it's one of the fastest declining forest types in the world. So of all the tropical forests in the world, it makes up less than 1% of that tropical forest. And then less than one-third of that 1% is available to prothonotary warblers here in the Americas. Um, between 1980 and 2000, 35% of the mangrove forests glob globally were lost, and basically about a half a percent of the world's mangroves are lost every year. So the problem with mangroves is that they're being developed. <clears throat> is the is the main most immediate problem. So they're in coastal areas in the tropics. So these are the perfect places to put golf courses and um, vacation resorts, things like that. And so in a lot of areas in, in Latin American countries and in the Caribbean, they're they're being filled and converted into these different uses. And that's one issue. The other issue for mangroves is climate change. Um, like I said. In a previous slide, um, the uh, Caribbean is, and the Caribbean region, including Central America, is ex expected to get extremely dry as climate change progresses. Um, all the climate change models that are out there agree on this, that as we move forward, the Caribbean is going to get drier and drier and drier. And we've started to see this in Jamaica even. This is a mangrove in Jamaica where this is normally a huge pond in the middle of the mangrove that's wet all year. <clears throat> it's usually full of crocodiles and whistling ducks, and we had a whole year we were down there where it looked like this. Um, so we're already starting to see that drying up of the Caribbean where times of areas that are normally wet all year round are actually starting to get drier and drier. The other issue is that with climate change, because of the melting of uh, uh, polar ice caps and things like that, sea levels are going to rise. And these forests are low-lying coastal forests. They're right on the coast. So as sea levels rise, that's also going to reduce the amount of mangroves available to prothonotary warblers and other birds. They're not the only birds that specialize on these habitats. And so for those reasons, um, I think it's really important to focus on what's happening on the wintering grounds and the breeding grounds for prothonotary warblers because both could potentially be negatively impacting them. And so this is just looking at what's going on with populations across the country. Uh, this is a map made by Clark Rushing. This uses breeding bird survey data. Um, and it's just showing for different clusters of populations here across the country. The minus signs are populations that are declining. The positive signs are populations that are growing. But the big thing I want to point out here is there's a big blank spot in the middle of this map. And it's right here in Ohio and then western Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, it's not that there's not cathodicary warblers here is that we don't have good data on what's happening on their populations locally, and so we don't even know if they're growing or declining um, and what are the real concerns for them. So because of these concerns across the range of the prothonotary warbler, many organizations have gotten together to work on these problems of their conservation, both figuring out their ecology across the full annual cycle and then also looking at measures we can take to help conserve them. So this was really launched by um, folks like Eric Johnson at the Louisiana Bird Observatory and Leslie Bullock at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, folks down with Audubon Panama. And so we've all gotten together and started to pool our resources and, and standardize all our research uh, to start looking at not only what's going on locally in all of our populations, but also across the whole range of the species to see what are the real issues that are facing the species, what's the implications of losing a lot of mangrove forest and losing a lot of forested wetlands on the breeding grounds, and what can we do to mitigate those changes. Next slide. 
And so I'm going to be starting work here in Ohio, and um, I was really excited when I started looking into the species here to discover Hoover Nature Preserve and all the amazing work that Charles Bombassi has been doing there, um, monitoring that population since the 80s. Um, and this is just showing a graph of the counts of uh, birds he has. And the nice thing about prothonotary warblers, as I'm sure many of you know, is they'll, they will use nest boxes. So while they have been losing availability of cavities in a lot of areas, you can create cavities for them. And so Char Charlie has been running 250 nest boxes out at Hoover Nature Preserve up, up in Delaware near Galena. Um, and there's a very large, vibrant population there now. And we're going to be collaborating to study these birds to look at what's happening on the breeding grounds. Um, and this is the largest population I know of in the state. Um, and so this is a really great opportunity to, to work together to, to look at what's kind of facing this population, um, not only here in Ohio, but I also want to connect the birds in Ohio to what's going on in the wintering grounds. And so I started doing some work in Panama. I went down to Panama this winter um, and met with uh, Leslie Bullock. She's there holding the, uh, the uh, net poles for our mist nets. Um, and we went down and started looking at sites where we can study prothonotary warblers in mangroves in Panama. So working both on the, um, the Caribbean side and the Pacific side of the Panama Canal where there are pretty good uh, intact mangroves and we're looking for more disturbed, drying out, um, getting developed sort of mangroves to look at different quality habitats for prothonotary warblers, look at similar things like we looked at with the red starts in terms of how they do in terms of their departure dates and their body condition and what foods are available to them. Um, so we can get a good idea of their wintering ecology, which not that much is known about. And these sites were great. This is one bird we caught down there. Walking around these mangroves, you actually see something really interesting, which is in some cases we would see flocks of, say, 10 or 12 um, prothonotary warblers all foraging together, which as a as somebody who gets really excited about prothonotary warblers and seeing them as a birder, to see 10 all at once is, is something I've never experienced before, so it was pretty cool. And so we're going to work with the uh, similar methods that we've used with um, Red Start to, to connect Panama to Ohio. And so the nice thing about mangroves is there's different types of mangroves that um, – that separate out in those carbon isotopes like I was showing um, with the red starts. And the, so in, additional, in addition to seeing like scrub and versus mangrove and carbon isotopes, we can use the same methods and look at different types of mangroves, which some are drier than others, um, and see how that impacts things like prothonotary warbler arrival dates and how those arrival dates affect how many breeding attempts they make. Um, Another thing I'm interested in looking at is how these birds do after they leave the nest, the young birds. Uh, this is a picture from Nate Cooper, who's working on a project on Kirtland's warblers right now. So that's actually a nestling Kirtland's warbler, uh, the endangered species up in Michigan. Um, the technologies are so amazing now that they make these radio transmitters you can put on a, on a young bird. They weigh less than half a gram. So that's less than half a penny weight. Um, you can attach them to these birds, and then they fall off after several weeks. Um, or you can recatch them and take them off because you can find them because it's a radio transmitter. Um, and what people have started looking at using this technology is that even though birds fledge from a nest, often they don't survive very long after they fledge the nest. And so while you might think the birds are being very successful, they might actually not be producing many young from the population because survival is low after they leave the nest. And so this is another thing I'm interested in looking at here on the breeding grounds is how well are prothonotary warblers doing after they, they fledge from nest. And so sorry for this complicated slide, but this essentially sums up what I'm hoping to do with the prothonotary warbler project. The interesting thing about prothonotary warblers in the middle of this, this flow chart, you'll see double brooding. Um, they will produce more than one brood of chicks in a year, and I'm really interested that's in contrast to a bird like red starts, which only produce one. Um, so I'm interested in seeing how winter habitat affects that because if birds are arriving earlier, they're probably more likely to get off two broods, have enough time to do that. Whereas if they're arriving later because they're in a poor winter habitat, they might not produce two broods, which means they're going to produce fewer young over the course of their lifetime. And so basically, if you concentrate on the left side, the extreme left side and the extreme left side of this, 
uh, flow chart, what I'm interested in doing is looking at how where these birds spend the winter ultimately affects how many young they produce. And if we can tie those things together, we can get an idea of how changes in habitat for these birds are going to affect their populations. If we lose a lot of mangroves like we're starting to now, what's that going to mean for prothonotary warblers? Are there fewer prothonotary warblers going to be able to migrate early enough to produce two broods? And that means the population over, as a whole is going to produce fewer young, which is going to probably cause populations to decline or stagnate. And so I think these are really important questions. And I'm really excited to kind of take what I've learned in these, you know, sort of common birds of red starts and what, what their ecology, what the ecology of, of winter can, can do to impact breeding and apply it to the species that in a conservation sense, we really need to, to reveal those, those links. Um, so that's all I have for today. I'm sorry I probably went over time, but um, I'm happy to take any, any questions any of you might have. Uh, last slide. Um, Great. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was fascinating. We never get to hear about wintering and full life cycle, and it makes you think that about all these studies that we've always read of birds on uh, breeding grounds and, and what other factors are really influencing that. So um, if there are any questions out there, please go ahead and start entering those in the chat box. But um, while we're waiting, I did have a question. You mentioned that um, American red starts defend territories in the winter. Is that a common yeah. behavior in lots of species um, that migrate? Um, obviously, when we see birds around here in the winter, we don't think of them as defending a territory. So is that a common behavior? Um, well, I, I would say it's fairly common. It, it varies, and it, it actually varies within just red starts. And so hmm. while the, the very dense population of red starts we have in Jamaica are territorial, you can go to some other places, like I've talked to people in Costa Rica, where red starts aren't as common. And there, red starts tend to join mixed species flocks. Um, mm. So it kind of depends on the, the the environment they're in, the habitat they're in, the density of competitors they have. Um, those kinds of things determine whether or not a bird is, is territorial. And <clears throat> as far as other species, we we have documented it in other species. So, you know, often the way we catch territorial birds on the breeding grounds is you can play song of that bird and it thinks right. it's an intruder on its territory and flies into a net. Well, mm -hmm. you can actually do that for a lot of species on the wintering grounds. Like oven birds seem to be pretty territorial huh. um, when they're on the wintering grounds in Jamaica. But for a lot of species, we just don't know because there's still a big gap in knowledge about the basic wintering ecology of a lot of species. We just don't. A lot of species just have not been intensively studied on the wintering grounds. So... They could be territorial, they could be flock joiners, they could just be roaming around. We we just really don't know until until more research happens. But yeah. I'll just I'll just add too, some of the birds around here are territorial through the winter also though. Um, oh, okay. Wren wrens is one that comes to mind. Like Carolina wrens will will defend their territory all year round. Huh. How interesting. Um, so we have a question. What are the advantages or disadvantages of using the small geolocators to track individual birds of red starts or for sanitary warblers on the wintering and breeding grounds? So I assume he means are there any sort of um, advantages or disadvantages to the to the bird itself maybe um, competitively or then maybe um, as far as um, research, um, what type of information you get from it? That's a great question. Um, so the advantages are we've never been able to get the kind of data we're getting from geolocators, we've never been able to get that data for small birds before. Um, the only exception would be the rare, very rare occasions where we've been able to relocate banded birds on their wintering mm -hmm. grounds. Um, so Kirtland's warbler is one case where that has happened, where it's such a small population, once they found Kirtland's warblers, they were actually able to find some of the individuals they had banded on the breeding grounds. But for most birds, that's not possible. Um, so the advantage is definitely that. Um, the disadvantage is there's a couple. One is that not so not that necessarily the geolocator is affecting the survival of the bird, but just by the way populations of these birds work, about 50% roughly, that's different species to species, population to population, but about 50% of birds don't come back every year. Um, you know, these birds live two to, for warblers, it's like two to seven years. Um, you know, rarely more than, you know, in rare cases, you'll, they'll live older than that. So just based on that, you know, a lot of birds are just going to die because of natural causes every year. 
So the way geolocators work is you put them out and then you get them back. You have to get them back to get the data from them. So when you put them out, you're going to lose half of the ones you put out. So the amount of data you get back toward compared to the effort that you put into it is not that great. Mm. Um, there has been some recent studies. I think there was a recent one in, in golden wing warblers that showed that they couldn't measure any effect on survival or condition of, of birds when they were carrying a geolocator. Um, and they work similar to um, you know, the way they're attached is similar to the way we put radio transmitters on birds. It basically, they wear like a backpack. Um, but I know there has been concern with species like aerial insectivores, um, like martens, where they're, they're so dependent on how well they fly that any sort of drag created by a device like that on their back um, could potentially um, could potentially impact their ability to forage. So depending on the ecology of the species, the, the geolocator could have some effect on, on their behavior and, and perhaps their survival. Um, so, the, but the, the advantage is really, you know, I, I think of the case of like the black swift where nobody knew where black swifts wintered. Right. And then they were able to put some geolocators out and discover, you know, they were all going to this one area in South America. Um, so, and then we're also learning just even for common species, the connectivity of populations. And so that's, when we talk about connectivity, it's do birds that breed in a specific area also winter in a specific area? Or is it just birds that breed in a specific area kind of just shotgun around all over the non-breeding range? And for some birds, we're finding that there are those strong connections. And that's important for conservation if you're, say, at, a, at the state level, if you want to conserve your birds that breed in your state, you want to know specifically where they're going to winter if you want to invest in their conservation in the winter. Um, so th those advantages, I, I would say, greatly outweigh the disadvantages, but we're really uh, it's really exponential of the way the technology is growing that I think we're very close to a point where geolocators are going to go by the wayside and there's going to be a better uh, a better thing coming forward. Uh, Pete Mara, actually, my, my mentor, is, is, is very active in that area trying to facilitate that sort of development. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Tanra, and I just want to welcome you to Ohio. I know you've been here a little while now, but um, we're all really looking forward to uh, seeing the work that you're going to do here, and I I'm sure that having you and um, the projects that you've um, proposed for prothonotaries, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the results from that. So, um, And thank you again for doing the webinar today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for sticking around a little bit extra here to get some questions in. Um, once again, our webinar was recorded today, and it will be posted by the end of next week on our website, um, obcinet.org. Um, and I hope that you um, will check out our website and sign on to receive monthly updates on our upcoming webinars in the series, and that you'll hopefully come back and join us again for another webinar. So um, thank you again, and thank you to, again, Dr. Conra, and I hope to see you all next month. No problem, and, and you all have my email there on the slide. If uh, anybody wants to contact me with questions after, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you.